by mowing constantly, we create a really dense root mat of grass roots that has, and those roots breathe, they respire, and that CO2 level is so high that tree roots are not, you know, very fond of that and then are kind of left to be below that. So they kind of miss out on all of that biological activity in the top few inches of soil. Hello, my name is Rio Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. Bringing us into this here episode 373 of Cider Chat was Ben Applegate. He is our featured guest on this here episode, and he is the orchard manager at Eden Specialty Cider, which is a Vermont-based cidery in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. And as we are on the topic of Vermont, and if you hear this episode years from now, you might be in the know about the epic flood waters of 2023 for July. There is flooding as this podcast is going live this week in Vermont, and I was just there. And I'll tell you, I was driving the the highways, but really the dirt roads of Vermont, just spectacular scenery, rolling hills, and really fun roads to drive about on. I have been all over the map in my recent travels to Vermont on both tar and dirt roads, and the dirt roads are rock solid. So with all this flooding, I know that Vermont will be bouncing back because, you know, they are not going to wait till the winter with snowpack coming uh, to get things done. They're going to deal with it straight away. But in the meanwhile, it is flooding. So I would say hang tight, but do make plans to head out to Vermont because you're going to be really inspired by hearing from our first guest in a series of episodes I'm going to be rolling out now all on Vermont. And he's going to be talking about orchard care in a cold climate, and that is Ben Applegate. So stay tuned for that. But of course, before we get to that future conversation, I do have a wee bit of news from out and about in Ciderville. This July 28th through the 30th, the first ever New York Apple Camp is taking place in the Hudson River Valley. And the location is the Ashokan Center, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous site, beautiful facilities. There's a bunkhouse. There's going to be camping. Registration is open now. So stop the bus, whatever you're doing, and go to the show notes for this year episode to get the link or Google NY Apple Camp. I do believe that should come up on your browser right to the Eventbrite tickets. Uh, There is a limited time right now uh, to the 21st of this month to get your tickets, so you don't want to delay. And these are some of the folks that are going to be attending. You're going to be meeting Dan Bussey, who wrote the Illustrated History of Apples in North America, okay, in the U.S. and Canada. That's what we're talking about here. He wrote the encyclopedia on it. He's driving in from Wisconsin, and he's bringing books. You could get signed copies. Also, we're going to have the Apple detective and also Apple historian John Bunker. He is based in Maine, and he's an author of a number of books, too, all about, like, Apple ID and Maine and just he's, – he's a guy behind the artwork for New York Apple Camp. We love John Bunker. He's been on the episode many times. Also, Gnarly Pippins is going to be there. That's Matt Kaminsky, Kevin Clark from Rose Hill Cider in New York, Dan Pucci from, well, what was known as the Wasail Cider Bar in New York City. And now Dan, of course, is still in the cider industry. He's been helping a lot with Apple Camp for New York this year. And we also have Eliza Greenman who was a keynote speaker at Maine Apple Camp last year. I produced that episode called The Superpower of Bradford Pears. You either love them or you hate them, those Bradford Pears. But she will talk up a lightning streak on so many different things. She's amazing. Super stoked for her. Also, Bill McKinley 
of the St. Lawrence Nurseries that is based in Potsdam, New York. He's going to be there too. And I will also, I'm going to be in the cider van camping out and making trouble. You know, I'll have a jug of cider. So come see me. (laughs) It's going to be a blast. Uh, Folks have been like contacting me saying they're signing up and you know, we need some good news and this is it for the summer. I know there's a lot of great events happening everywhere, but if you can make New York Apple Camp, you're not going to be disappointed. Uh, if we want learn one thing from the past three years is that don't delay. Don't put off tomorrow thinking, oh, there's going to be another year because you never know what's going to happen to people and um, and the times. So I'll hope, hopefully see you at New York Apple Camp. Again, uh, Google NY Apple Camp 2023 for the Eventbrite tickets or just go to this year podcast show notes. So this is episode 373. You can find it at ciderchat.com. Walk into the orchards. Just during that little ditty, I had to make a little pause here during the production and go answer the door for yet another cider delivery. I have a whole bunch queued up and in the fridge for what I call Bottles on My Desk. And this is a little video series that goes up at the Cider Chat YouTube channel. So if you haven't subscribed yet, do, because it's fun. And it's a little bit more candid. I I guess I'm pretty candid already, but you know what I'm saying. And I'm just trying to like delve into that, like one bottle at a time, truthfully, because that's kind of how I like to drink cider and drink in general. It's just really luxuriate over that one cider. So they're short little videos. Again, subscribe Cider Chat YouTube channel. The box that just came in today with an ice pack on it, which is pretty cool, with cans enclosed, came from Dutton Cider Company, and that's based in Sebastopol, California. It's a Gravestein cider, and I'll be talking more about that. Um, Gravesteins are really well known in that area. Lots of good cideries around there, and hopefully they are preserving those trees. And then I have a box waiting from Renaissance Orchard, and that's based in Ferndale, Washington. Uh, that's probably going to be a standalone podcast. Uh, Abermile Cider Works down in Virginia sent a box of cider. Can't wait to open that up and taste it. But currently in my fridge, let's see, currently in my fridge is a bottle from Cockrell Cider in Washington State. So Rich gave me that at uh, CiderCon, and I, I got to open it, Rich. I haven't yet, and I, you know I'm saving it for bottles on my desk. I also have a bottle of Kentucky Ranch Cider. This is from Thatcher Winery and Vineyard, which is in Paso Robles, California. Super excited about that because, again, this is a winery bringing in the cider. Looks like a beautiful bottle, 100% heirloom ciders. So both Rich's bottle and the the bottle from cider, or, or winemaker, they call him, but he's a cider maker too. That's Sherman Thatcher. He is, or Th- Thatcher, I'm not, there's no T there, Thatcher. Uh, those are being cooled and I'm going to be recording those soon. You know, the thing about, you know, being a podcast, getting a lot of cider samples is not, you can't just be opening and drinking them. You know, you have to give respect to the makers who are sending them your way. And this is one way that I get to do that. Uh, along with doing the podcast and kind of a lot of little multitask and I'm I'm working it to keep up and keep you informed. I know doing every other week right now might feel like there's a lost, you know, sandbar somewhere and you're stuck in the middle of the ocean. But do know that next week also at the YouTube channel, I'll be releasing the audio synced with the PowerPoint slideshow all on spontaneous fermentation that was released in the last episode, 372, pre-recorded at CiderCon. So if you've been waiting for that, this is a good time to subscribe because you will get notified, a notification in your inbox that that video is now live. And it's just Hugh Guichard talking about the yeast associated with spontaneous fermentation. You'll have the slides synced. It's a good delve into that topic if you're into wild ferments. And of course, there's the bottles on my desk. There's a lot going on here, Ciderville. It's just, it's a full cup. It's a full cup scenario. And speaking of full cup, I want to tip my glass to a couple folks here, and I'll be right back with that. Dancing in the 
streets smelling all the blossoms kicking up our feet cider chat is listener supported i also have sponsors too but primarily it is listener supported there's a donate button at ciderchat.com and there's also the cider chat patreon page, which is a website that helps content producers like myself keep rolling out our work via your support. There's different levels that you could join. And one is called the Cider Going Up campaign. And this is for folks in the cider trade. It costs about two bottles of cider per month. So if you think that this podcast is worth your time and you're getting some info, then do consider supporting it. Uh, Some of the folks that have been really rock solid for quite a while. It just floors me. One is Insider Japan. That is Japan's only bilingual English and Japanese magazine. It's online. Lee Reeve is working it, really trying to like push the cider agenda in Japan in the best way possible. Ross Cider and Perry Company is based in Ross on Wide. Their Ross Cider Fest is coming up. Labor Day weekend this year. If you haven't gone, it's a must. It's a Mecca. You must attend. Beautiful people. All all these folks I've had episodes with. Press Then Press is an online cider vendor. So they curate ciders from all over the map and can mail them out through just about every single state in the U.S. of A. Bent Ladder is based in Ohio. They're both a cidery and a winery. I've tasted some of their ciders. They're delicious. Esoterra Cider Works is in Dolores, and that is Dolores, Colorado. That is uh, essentially the the four corners of the U.S., so those four states, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. Just a, a brilliantly beautiful place. And they have cool apples there. There's a whole story around that. I I want to go out to uh, that area. Thinking about it, there's a big event happening in October. Hmm. Anywho, uh, also <laughs> coming back in uh, this side of the world, in Pennsylvania, in Dunmore, Pennsylvania, is Space Time Mead and Cider Works. That's in eastern Pennsylvania. Then in western P- Pennsylvania is Taddy Bogle Cider Works. That's in Acme. It's just outside of Pittsburgh. They've just been building a big pavilion at Taddy Bogle, a beautiful location to go to. I mean, this is a, a place that you could hang out for a while, just a nice, big, breathtaking, long view, fields, and of course, our friend, Kurt Henry. Back in London is Duck Chicken Cider, and they are working it. They make their cider in their flat in South London and look for their cans out and about in London at, at your favorite bars. If they're not there, ask for Duck Chicken. And I want to do a little shout out to Red Island Cider up in Prince Edward Island. Uh, just, I know Robert there has been, um, well, you know, when we returned from the French Cider Tour last year, he was hit by a hurricane. That was kind of crazy. You know, all these kind of like traumatic climate events, and yet these cider makers keep on trucking. It's really, really uh, commendable. Uh, When they first came online, it was during the pandemic, and they gave up their coffee money at Red Island Cider so they could help support (laughs) Cider Chat. That is just too cute. So thank you. Thank you to all these uh, commercial cider makers and folks in the industry for helping this podcast roll out and for all the folks who are just supporting it at whatever level you can. It's, It's what keeps it on the air. It truly, truly does. So check it out. Donate button at ciderchat.com or the Cider Chat Patreon page. That's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Up next is our featured conversation with Ben Applegate, who's the orchard manager at Eden Specialty Ciders. We're out walking about in block one. There's three blocks of orchards. They're each about two acres apiece. Eden uses apples from this site and also works with a lot of local orchards, which is a great way to support orchardists. And Ben is not only the orchard manager, but he's also helping like press the apples on site, managing, well, you'll hear all about it, those preliminary steps for making ice cider. Eden is world-renowned for their ice cider. 
And here's your chance now to grab a glass and join this chat with Ben Applegate, the Orchard Manager at Eden Specialty Ciders, based in Vermont. I started off in the forestry world. I went to school for forestry, mostly because I loved hiking and backpacking and just always had loved trees. As a kid, I was a huge tree climber, just, you know, romping around in the mm-hmm. forest. And so I studied forestry, but really got into forest ecology. And this was at UNH in the mid nineties. I didn't know it at the time, but mycorrhizae had just become this huge topic in the forest uh-huh. forest ecology world. Yeah. And I didn't realize until much later that that was such a new kind of awareness. Can you in explain the world. what that is for folks who don't really know Yeah, that so mycorrhizae is a symbiotic uh, fungus. It grows in or around tree roots and it and it receives carbohydrates in exchange for water and nutrients that all those mycelium are getting out of the soil. And most plants have this association, so it's very ancient. There's only a few groups of plants that do not. Mm -hmm. And so that just totally fascinated me and reinforced that whole, you know, idea of a a web that we talk about in ecology. And so um, that was kind of my background in the the tree world. And Mm -hmm. I came to to orcharding much later. So that that was, I came via, started doing arborist work and started pruning apple trees for people. And, and then I, you know, like I said, interacted with Eleanor at a pruning workshop. And once I started at Eden, uh, I took a deep dive into, into the apple world and orcharding yeah. practices. And fortunately for me, uh, Michael Phillips was not far away. He's not, he's about, a, you know, 40 minutes to the east in mm-hmm. New Hampshire. I had heard of Michael previously by his books. Mm-hmm. I actually heard him speak at the Common Ground Fair in Maine in the, the late community. 90s yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, at a workshop. And I bought his first book, The Apple Grower, the first edition back then. But it wasn't until a decade later that I was doing this that I was like, hey, I got to mm. get into the world. And I reached out to Michael and he pulled me down to Stump Sprouts and, and to the Berkshire Round Table and I got to interact with the old timers like John Bunker and yeah. Hugh Williams and yeah. Alan Supernod and yeah. of course Michael and, and, and many others, uh, Elizabeth Ryan, yes. those kind of folks. But then there was a younger group, a lot of the, the current cider makers like Eric Schatt from the Finger Lakes, Steve Sellen, Garrett Miller, mm-hmm. and, you know, yeah. Autumn check from you know from those cideries in the Finger Lake so it was like another generation mm-hmm. and I kind of came in at that time Perfect. and what a wonderful kind yeah. of awareness and so I really became a mentee of, of Michael's kind of holistic organic health management as he refers mm-hmm. to it and mm-hmm. that's the those are the orcharding practices that I, I, I pretty much follow. This was planted in 2008 by Eleanor and family. I came on to Eden in 2009. I met Eleanor at a pruning workshop. I was hosting a pruning rock workshop through a local nonprofit that I used to work for called Northwoods Stewardship Center. And Eleanor met me and invited me over and showed me around and, and then offered a job. And then we planted two more blocks the following year. So 2009 and then 2010. Most of this orchard is on dwarf rootstocks with the exception of these liberty trees right here which are on m111 and um, we'll come back to that when we talk about climate stuff and 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 maybe a little bit what rootstocks really i would suggest for northern climates but um, you can just kind of see the the differences so on our left this liberty that are on the m111 rootstock they're probably approaching, you know, 15 to seven feet in height. Um, they have a crown spread of probably a similar dimensions. Um, and they have probably two, two to three scaffold layers. Whereas the Grimes Golden on our right on bud nine is really a one lower scaffold and, and maybe only 10 to 12 feet. And the, really the big difference is the girth of the trunk. The Liberty's trunks are uh, approaching, you know, five to six inches is girth and the lower four feet and the, and the Grimes Golden are, are more like two to three inches mm-hmm. in girth. So just the, you know, amount of... Same year planted same year totally planted. totally different experience. The one thing about the Grimes Golden, some of them had sun scald in the earlier years and were cut back and regrew, but still it's a very, it's a very apt comparison. Mm-hmm. You can kind of see that around. Mm-hmm. The orchard and so. it's uh, and spacing wise it's it's pretty close you yes know? it was it was all to, meant to be sort of on a vertical um 
a one high wire on a scaffold for these dwarf uh, rootstocks and that the M111 just got clumped into that. So they're a little too close. And in fact, I'm starting to thin out and mm. probably have to remove a tree or two, but six to eight feet between trees was the original design. And then about 12 to 14 feet alleyways. Um, in hindsight, I think Ooh, uh, wider, spacing. Wider, wider spacing alleyways yeah. for sure. I've yeah. had to take out some rows or some trees because of that, that tightness. So we are in block one here. And, and this is a mixed planting of primarily yeah. dessert fruit at the time because in the early days of Eden, we only made ice cider, which is made from primarily oh, dessert okay. fruit yeah. with, with some focus on acidity, right? To balance right. all that sweetness. Yeah. But over time, we started making hard ciders and so the plantings have reflected that. So new plantings, um, and, and there was always a little scattering of things, like there's a tremlets bitter over here that went in in the early days. But now we're planting more things that are focused on hard ciders. In, in block one? Yeah. It, still, it, so top working some of these Top trees, working or planting new. Grafting new, new yeah, varieties exactly. on, um, you know, on existing. top working is a grafting. Exactly, so yeah. we can actually walk and see some of those yeah, top and I would working. love to see that. Yeah, because this was an experimental orchard, there's only about five to 10 of a variety, mm -hmm. and then it changes. So a whole row is not one variety, and the thought there in the early days was maybe this would, you know, make it harder for any particular insect to find, you know, to keep working one variety that's at a particular stage of development. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's really that true, but that was the kind of thought. The one nice thing about it too is it just mixes up the orchard to make it a little more diverse and that you have different varieties all over mm -hmm. the place. And so mm -hmm. that feels more like a forest to me. I didn't know that it was, um, that this was primarily originally all dessert fruit. Yeah, yeah so, but it made sense because that's what was her goal. That's how she got into cider. Yeah, cider. We, got, we entered cider through the through the ice cider, and that was the primary focus. Ironically, though, all the fruit that comes from this orchard goes into hard cider. We almost all. Sometimes we'll send some to cold storage for ice cider, but that's a pretty small mm -hmm. amount. It's a sm kind of a small batch because mm -hmm. you need so many apples for ice cider. You because sure of do. that ice yeah. concentration process. Yeah. You're doing a damn good job here. Oh, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, this is not all the apples for Eden cider. Oh, not even close. <laughs> but that, that's, that is another piece of it. It's that, you know, as the cidery grows, you need more apples. It just yeah. kind of goes with it, you know. Yeah. And what makers come into something like that with a bounty of enough apples right. for all their yeah their, well and that was point. that was always eleanor's goal was really to support the existing apple industry in yeah. vermont this was just like let's keep a pulse on what's going on tinker experiment to see you know and you know just to be tied into the landscape more so that that's and so, yeah, it, this has provided an incredible luxury, luxury for us to experiment, mm -hmm. which we're not, you know, we're not trying to make this financially solvent. We're trying to experiment and tinker and hopefully, you know, encourage our, the people we source from to try some of those things. That's still to be determined. But, you know, I think that that's worthy work to do. Are you, is your, what is, what is your job title? Orchard manager. Orchard manager. Okay. <laughs> but does that also mean that you, you're picking the apples, you're bringing them in, yes. are you doing so, any of the crushing or is yes. it the cider maker? Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of apples to juice. Apples to juice. So okay, then that's a big role. Yeah. So I, we will, we historically would press more of the interesting heirloom fruit from Scott farm here. Oh. Um, not and, this year. Not this year. Um, now we use a bigger, um, press box mill in, in Western Mass to do a lot of the stuff for ice cider. A lot of the stuff in the fall that's coming from smaller growers, us included, neighbors, Poverty Lane sometimes in New Hampshire, certainly uh, some other growers in Vermont that we get various things like spy. There's a great mm. Yates family orchard in, in Moncton. She has a nice. bunch of spy. Nice. So we get oh. a bunch of spy. So I do a lot of that. I run the the press um, and get it into juice form, and then I bring it to Newport in a tote you know, on a you know trailer type setting. Is this a trailer that? Yes, using? this is the trailer. Okay, so I pop it up with yeah, I pop it up with forklift. yeah forklift and bring it in. And, and then in the winter, up. I'm in charge of freezing juice, so all the juice okay. that's concentrated comes you must here. Be camping out at the farmhouse well, then, yeah, that's like 
the temperature has dropped. Yeah, Let's go I only live 10 minutes away, oh, so perfect. I just oh, pop good. over here. Oh, and so, but yeah, I'm, I'm a master at the forklift in all kinds of weather conditions. And so all the freezing, the juice happens out here. And going down that hill, oh, does, yeah. it, does it get icy? It does. It does. So oh. mostly I get all of the juice wow. in the fall into the cidery before winter. And then ice cider freezing now takes a majority of winter because we don't have the same we used to have consistently a stretch of a few days where it was like in the negative 30s for lows yeah, and wouldn't hard. get above zero for highs yeah now we're getting like little snippets an overnight or not enough not time. enough and so it's been a, a harder juggling act and Cut but anyway that ice cider from eden i'll tell you i know it's going to be a, a very ice cider production is going to become a more limited entity in the future as a traditional method but people are making ice yes, cider in a, totally you know, in we're a gonna place. have to we're gonna have to move yeah. to more freezing yeah. and freezers yeah. unfortunately yeah. which yeah. is kind of sad because the whole kind of bioregionalism aspect of the product was about having apple trees that grew in the place where you could then have the winter cold to freeze that juice but well, I mean, you could do like county cider up in uh, 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 Ontario, right? Where they let the apples freeze on the tree. Right, right. They're not doing it with the juice. Yeah. And I imagine you probably do have enough cold for the apples to freeze on the tree. We have done some of that. We actually got apples both from this orchard and then an orchard right across the border in Stansted, and we picked them on like January first or second. Wow. The unfortunate thing is we couldn't, that concentrate was only at about 22 bricks. So it wasn't oh, that much sweeter than, much sweeter. Yeah, yeah, so it is harder, I think. And what kind of bricks are you looking for? 35, 35 yeah. on so average. It's a big jump. It's a big jump. Yeah. So it is, it is harder. It, what people have done in Quebec historically is you let that frost happen a little bit, but then you pick the apples and you put them in racks that you move in and out based on temperatures or leave them out. Um, and then, but I don't know what the bricks level. I probably would still only be in the high 20s. But it depends on the variety. You also need certain varieties that will hang on the tree. Cortland does that pretty well. How about the Franklin? Is that hanging on the tree? No, no it'll fall. Dry? Okay. It'll okay. fall. Yeah. Yeah. If it yeah. falls and you can't yeah. use it, so yeah. it has to be on the tree. There are certainly Quebec producers, obviously, that, that do that cryo, mm -hmm. you know, extraction rather than concentration mm -hmm. on the, in, in mm -hmm. the juice form. Um, but yeah, definitely a little trickier, but yeah. So yeah, there's some change to that, but I mean, the nice thing is that there, you know, as you've covered so well, there's so many different cider styles and, and you just can't be reliant maybe on any one style. You're going to yeah, have to you diversify, diversify your style, just like you diversify your fruit. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and that's the way of farming and being yeah. a maker. Yeah. 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 Right on. So there's actually Spartan right there next to this Northern Spy. Okay. So we got up to around almost 50 varieties at the peak a few years back, but I've been now weeding out as we've learned some varieties just aren't working that well. The other thing for those of you who can't see, it's a very <laughs> wild understory. And I'll talk about that in terms of what Michael has termed biological mowing, which is waiting to to cut the grass at infrequent intervals. That first cut of the grass ideally would be timed with the root flush of the trees early to mid-June, pretty much scythe or you know use a string trimmer or something like that. Yeah. But the idea is to have a diverse understory, let things go through their cycle, even reaching seed. Mm -hmm. And therefore what is happening below is a much more open soil by mowing constantly, we create a really dense root mat of grass roots that has, and those roots breathe, they respire, and that CO2 level is so high that tree roots are not, you know, very fond of that and then are kind of left to be below that. So they kind of miss out on all of that biological activity in the top few inches of soil. It's kind of messy and it's, you know, you get wet in the morning. It's really about what's going on below ground. That's what boots are for. That's what's right. That's what <laughs> boots are for. So that's kind of a part of that kind of yeah. uh, holistic management that mm -hmm. we kind of talk about. And also we have to think that. about the habitat for right. beneficial insects, you know, whether those are predatory wasps or whatever that are in there, you're giving lots of habitat and you're also feeding the pollinators constantly. Right now we have buttercup and vetch flowering and those all are, are doing, you know, 
certain ecosystem services, right? They're, they're pulling nutrients up out of the soil and then laying them back down. Yeah. The other nice thing about the scythe is you're cutting the material and then letting it decompose. Mm -hmm. You're not, you know, and you also suppress it. there with the scythe, huh? Yeah. Like it's, it's, what was it? A little bit of a learning curve? Oh, totally. It, I mean, this is a scythe, just so folks know, like, you know, you see these old photos like from Holland. Right, yeah, you know, right. the beak. Of, yeah. I mean, how do you explain that instrument? Yeah, it's a it's a wooden snab uh, that is about your height, yeah. um, and this is a European style. The wood, the American one is a little bit more onerous. It's heavier, heavier. And, and the blade is poured and not pounded. Hmm. Whereas you want a really light blade and a really light snab. You constantly are sharpening that blade with a whetstone, but then every four to eight hours of, of, of mowing, you peen the blade with a hammer. You actually pound the metal back out into a very thin layer to then keep sharpening. Because as you sharpen with the whetstone, you take off metal and you make it blunter. And so it's a constant back and forth of thinning the metal and then sharpening it back down. How long does the blade last for? It can last for years if you take Just good care of it. Pounding, yeah. yeah, and there's different weights of blades. So there's grass blades, there's ditch blades. They even have blades for cutting small saplings that are much shorter and mm -hmm. stouter, mm -hmm. thicker metal. Um, but they can last quite a while. But if you catch, you know, metal objects or something, you can really damage a blade sure. and you can file it. So it depends on, yeah. on what Keep you're your mowing. Keep your orchard clear. Yeah, right, right. yeah. If you, yeah. If you you're in rocks. Where mowing or where you're scything. <laughs> A lot of people have seen these, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned, like in artwork. and But it's a fantastic tool that allows you to get underneath this, like, canopy in a way that you wouldn't yeah. otherwise. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely, I mean, compared to the string trimmer, you're running a, a motor that's loud. And yeah. you're also, you're beating the material. Whereas yes. a scythe is really cutting it like a knife. You're cutting it just like you would cut greens out of a, out of a vegetable bed. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. And it's peaceful. You hear yes. everything. Yes. It is a little bit of work and it takes work some, out. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a workout work and it yeah. takes a little bit of technique, but it's really this wonderful meditative motion mm -hmm. that once you get decent at, you can you can move right along. It's like the difference between power boating with a string trimmer, which yep. is gas powered, versus in a sailboat. Right. Where it's just like wind power, in this right. case human power. Right. And it's just yep. A beautiful to watch yeah, too. Yeah, nice. So at scale, you would need a lot more people, or there you could. There are some uh, mechanized tools like the BCS walk behind tractors make mm -hmm. a double sickle bar mower, which allows you to chop the grass but not beat it up. You're, mm -hmm. you're cutting it just like the scythe, and you mm -hmm. can do that at scale. And mm. so um, people have have good luck with that too. Mm. Um, in terms, of if you wanted, if you had more, you know, multiple acres to do. You could you could turn to mechanization mm -hmm. to do that. In my ideal world, we'd have a lot more people in agriculture, and we'd have a labor pool to <laughs> come in and thin the fruit and inside the orchard. That would be like the the key a moment, thing. a beautiful thing in June. All that right. labor, and right, then right. and then until well, you get to harvest. Keep on believing, and, <laughs> That's and, right. you know, it may happen. So this is an example of the, the Tremlet's Bitter, and there's just four of them. So this is a, a cider variety that it may not be the true Tremlet's from England. There's the whole Geneva Tremlet's because mm -hmm. of some, you know, some of the scion wood. Uh, so I believe this is the Geneva Tremlet's. Was this top work then? No, this was, this, this, no, this is, was not top okay, work. This so was, was brought in. And, it, and it's, it's a, and this is a great kind of example of the challenges of a cold climate. So this is probably more of a zone four or even zone five, I think really zone five apple. And so I get sporadic crops depending on the mildness of the winter. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if I have a mild winter, I don't have bud, you know, flower bud, you know, winter kill and mm -hmm. I'll get some fruit, but often it's pretty marginal. That would be one of the things I would really reinforce about, about both climate change, but also cold, hard growing. Important to experiment, but don't, you know, be careful about what you pick to grow. This is more like maybe this will work in the future, but not right now in terms of a reliable cropper. Um, mm -hmm. So, but it is good to keep putting things because our climate is changing and, and what is true now is going to be very different from what is, was mm -hmm. true in 10 or 20, 20 years, years, which in yeah. a tree lifetime is, is not that long. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, that's kind of <laughs> something to think about. So we're looking at a tree right now that is, again, it's not a standard size. It's not a hot tree, as one would say in French. It's um, probably about 12 feet high and spans out, I would say, I'm going to be guessing around 11 feet or so yeah. out. And 
it it has a little bit of a spaciousness here. So it's really been able to spread out yeah. and have as much natural growth as possible. Really lovely. And it's on the edge of the block one orchard here. Really pretty. And then the, the other variety that's right here that I've really come to, to love is Grimes Golden, uh -huh. which is a West Virginia apple, believe, yeah. you know, and from the south. And I had, we saw a little bit right in that when we first started, but we'll, we'll walk by some of these. Um, they originally had some issues with sun scald when they were one and two year old. So for us in March, we have a fair amount of snowpack, sometimes as much as three to four feet because we're kind of at the end of winter and our snowpack is built up. And we have days where we have good sunlight and it's reflecting off the snow, but then come nightfall, it, the temperature drops. So you could be up, you know, in the high, the temperature could be in the 30s, 40s during the day. And certainly that reflection off the snow mm -hmm. and then onto the surface of the trunk, that trunk could be even warmer. It could be up into the 60s. Mm -hmm. And then at night it could drop into the 20s, if right. not teens, right. um, single digits even. I mean, March is still a winter month in Northeastern Vermont. Yes. And so when you, trees are very young, when they're just one, two year old, not including the nursery years, but after they've been moved into the orchard, they're pretty sensitive. And so I had a lot of, uh, of these have sun scald and I thought I lost them, but I sprouts regrew from below the sun scald injury. I cut mm. those off and I was a little more diligent about putting guards a little bit higher and they've mm. come back and they've mm. been one of the best reliable producers and what a wonderful apple, the yes. acidity. Yeah. And I think because of our soils, our soils are fine sandy loams over granitic till meaning that the till was scraped by the glaciers from, from granite plutons, both in Canada and locally. And so we have a lot of acidity in our soils naturally, and it certainly comes through in our mm -hmm, fruit. Mm -hmm. Eden is, if we're never lacking in acidity in our cider. But it's balanced acidity, but it is which is really key to know. Like people hear that, it's like, oh, I don't really like acid. I'm not a big fan of high acid ciders myself, but a balanced cider with, you know, yeah, yeah. balanced acid yeah oh yeah. yeah and eat it really hits that spot on. yeah so the anyway i i guess my point to all of this is that what trees start off looking light is not necessarily their true nature mm -hmm. so i had a lot of point. success with early french varieties like muscadet um clochard renette in block three and some of these like grimes that i was like or or newton pippin or um you know some others I was like in the earlier is like, ah, I don't know if these are going to make it. You know, it's always this guessing game. It's kind of reverse now. Grimes is like steadfast, reliable. I love these trees. Clochard, Muscadet kind of are petering out, mm. getting you know, more susceptible to, mm -hmm. to canker, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. more susceptible to black rot because they're mm -hmm. just not as, mm -hmm. it's not as vigorous and they're not, the, the cold winters are, are taking their toll taking on them toll. and they're not not working out as well. Yeah, well that so, could change really quickly yeah. if, if you talk about cold winters, which yeah. is yeah. rapidly becoming yeah. warmer. The rest of this row is top work. This is Binet Rouge. We had a few in block three that were on bud nine, and now this it was top worked over Cameo, which is a more um, kind of a modern, you know, dessert fruit variety. And this created is created more vigor, which is helpful because what I found with the dwarfing rootstocks in a cold climate on relatively nutrient poor soils is that you need a little more oomph, oomph yeah. especially on a, a variety like Binet Rouge that's more of a, a dwarfing tree already in terms of its vigor. And so I'm having a little more success uh, with this kind of top working because you get that interstem, you get that cameo kind yeah. of vigor. Yeah, yeah. The one issue of this is that you have some early risk in the first few years of wind breakage and we'll see that sometimes they've failed because they've snapped they because they're growing so quickly and then the wind comes in the fall and that they'll break at the graft union but if you can get them through the first few years you can see how it's really kind of swallowing yeah, around I the trunk see that totally i'll get a little um, photo for folks to see that and we'll have a few more options to look at too to, as we go along here. We're trying to pick varieties, more cider varieties, to get more cider varieties. The attachment point there is a little, a little suspect, I guess is the best way to say it. So what we're looking at here is the trunk of the tree. Uh, right, and yeah, so we have, we have the root system that's probably bud nine. Most of these are bud nine. There might be a Geneva 16 or 11 in here occasionally, but 
Most of it's Bud 9, and then you have the variety, in this case, Cameo. And what happened is I would cut, uh, this would be, I was doing bark grafting, so not cleft in the winter, but bark grafting. So in springtime, right when green tip is happening, when green tissue is poking out, I would cut the whole tree off except for one limb. And this mm -hmm. is, you can see the remnants mm -hmm. of the old limb as a nursery mm -hmm. branch. And then I put two scions in. And in some places, I most places I, I cut off to one scion after a couple of years. Sometimes I I think in hindsight, it might be better because you see what's happened. It's like the side that I left the scion on is growing, whereas mm -hmm. the side that's not is is decomposing. And yeah. so it's a race to see if this trunk can grow over and right. seal yep, the, that old trunk, the, old, the, the, the decomposing yeah. trunk there, and, and it may or may not happen. This but, is uh, blue pear mane, by the way. Oh, it is? Oh, it's a beautiful, so, yeah, beautiful, Yeah, this is a great apple. Yeah. So what I'm looking at here is a lot of people would come up to this, and if you had an apple tree like this in your backyard and you're not like a big, you know, orchardist, as Ben is here, who knows, you know, has a bit of history with the, the apple trees, you say, oh man, that doesn't look really good or healthy. But I've seen trees like this that are like 150 years old and completely hollowed out. Yeah. And it's just the outer, the outer bark, the cambium layer is still like, yes, has vitality right. yeah. and is pumping it. Yeah. And, um, and not only that, it's beautiful. And there's like little, <laughs> you know, right. um, integrated you know, yeah. a web of life right, right. in there totally. with the living and the dead. Yeah, that, that's what's so cool about yeah. trees is yeah. that they're, they have all different stages and, and you, it makes you kind of be aware that there's more than just what your goal is mm -hmm. because the ecosystem is greater than any one goal. Completely. And so that's yeah. a nice way to think of it. For a culinary orchard, there's some really nice, yeah, more yeah. cider. Yeah, there, well, and dual purpose, right? Things yeah, that are traditionally been yeah. used for many things, which is very much, you know, a throwback to, to more our subsistence farming that yes. was so true of our country in the 17 and 1800s. So these or, old heirloom varieties had those attributes because the mm -hmm. people were selecting for multi-purposes. Mm -hmm. So, and this is, yeah, Blue Permain is what a wonderful apple and so cool as it turns color as the colder days come in the fall and you go from, you know, an apple that's, that's a darker, you know, color to begin with into that purples and, and almost like deep, almost streaks of, of uh, you know, navy blue at times. It's incredible, incredible fruit to, mm. to watch mature. And how about that sugar? Oh man. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, a couple blue pear mains and then we moved to an apple that's an English apple originally, but uh, we've had fairly luck with it, which is a Stembridge cluster. And this is, uh, I think of as probably the most uh, multifaceted of our cider fruit here because it has, you know, the, the good sugars, but certainly decent acidity and tannins in it. And, and they're very nice tannins. And so um, we have never, we don't have enough of these to do a single varietal of Stembridge cluster, but maybe someday this is, this is one that's worked pretty well. How many of these trees do you have in the orchard? We had initially five and then I've top worked another, you know, seven or eight here so okay. still still yeah still happening <laughs> still happening yeah folks aren't able to experience while we're walking out here but you've already mentioned is it you're in an orchard but you're also in this entire ecosystem of different plant life and you could feel the vitality in the orchard like everywhere there's blossoms which is you know there's beehives over there and they're being kept busy and you know apple trees they are very welcoming, like not yeah. only in the glass, but to other plants. Like, yeah. They want to be surrounded. A mowed lawn feels rough to me. Like I, I, I really, that to, for some that's very comforting, but to me, because I think of the ecology mm -hmm. awareness, that that's a big red flag to me. It feels sterile and it really is true because there's so much going on when you allow plants to actually grow. Mm -hmm. uh, we have both field plants, but also, you know, kind of field edge, like lots of ferns creeping in. We've got, um, you know, wood ferns here. There's bracken fern occasionally. There's also many species. Interrupted fern is right up against mm -hmm. the, the woods edge and is kind of working its way in. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the springtime, there's trout lilies everywhere, oh, which I have always beautiful. thought of as more of like a of a forest kind of understory. But it's really I've I've learned that you know plants will take advantage of anything and and reused aged composted manure when we first planted the orchard in rows. And I think it actually came in the trout lilies came in in that initial you know kind of fertility building exercise of adding that manure. 
and they just continue to flourish. It's like every spring they just come up and it's like the first thing blooming in the spring and it's such a wonderful treat. At, at this point, we're, we are recording here at the tail end of June, like next week is July. So what is your management at this stage? I've really gotten through the spring kind of holistic sprays. And like mm -hmm. I said, I really was influenced by Michael Phillips. I not only read his books, they're constant resource, but I got to rub shoulders with Michael quite a bit. And I've really kind of, you know, bought full into his spray system, which is based around neem oil, liquid fish, effective microbes, seaweed, and then herbal teas in the summer, comfrey, horsetail. I don't have great access to nettles, but I'm working on that. I've got mm, a, a smaller a great, nettle patch, but up here, ironically, nettles aren't as common. Nettles you are. find if you find the wood nettle in the woods, but we don't have as much as the stinging nettle because of our, I think, our just climate. climate. Um, but anyway, those are important. And then the real next frontier for me, which I haven't, I've been, it's been on my back of my mind, is really getting into composted teas and really getting, you know, trying to make woodsy compost from both trees in the woods, but also now that I have enough apple trees from their leaf litter and trying to to brew really interesting compost teas. So that's really on the horizon for me because I think there's a lot that can be done. So that in addition with the effective microbes well, that well, I'm brewing up. So well, those, those are... Um, um, I buy a mother culture, mix it with molasses and kind of grow them out for about 10 days. And those are some species of lactobacillus, some yeast. And the, the brand that I'm using um, is Terraganics. Um, and, and so I buy that mother culture. But again, I think down the road, if I can get to a point with compost teas, I could probably just replace that product. Mm -hmm. But for now, it's my co competitive sure. colonization on the surface of the leaf. And all of those things, I mean, you can read Michael Phillips's book, they all work together to both stimulate the tree's immune system, but mm -hmm. also add the fatty acids, mm -hmm. add, you know, things at the right moment to, to get the tree sort of ramped up in mm -hmm. producing. It's not an annihilation. You can see apple scab. We just passed some uh, when we were in the blue pear mains. It, it, it's not an eradication. It's, it's to try to get the, the tree to to have enough support to have have it be attacked by things, but to to respond to that and, and get through it. Have a strong immune system. And have a like strong immune system. Yep. And I and and those you know flavonoids and terpenoids that they produce to defend themselves. This I'm talking about plants and trees. Those some of those compounds make their way into the cider as interesting flavors. And so I think the more we can kind of especially for cider fruit growing, having a little bit of blemish on the fruit is not a bad thing. It's actually an indication that the, that the, the tree and the plant has, is really living in a, in a world where there's lots of things going on. Mm -hmm. So same thing with insects. You know, there are these important insects that parasitize the sort of pests. If there's no pests, then you lose your parasitizing insects. It's, you know, and that's what mm -hmm. sort of ecosystem management and philosophy in the orchard is all about. It's having a little bit of everything that, and, and kind of trying to use your hand in a light way to kind of influence things, but you're not trying to get rid of anything per se. Yeah. So and build up what was already build, naturally occurring. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and so an artificial environment. Yeah. So back to your question of what I'm <laughs> yeah. doing now. So yeah. I've gotten through those, I was spraying every seven to 10 days through the spring months from, you know, about pink or or tight cluster until now. And that, that interval will back off to about every two weeks through July, maybe two sprays in August at, at most, maybe even one, uh, depending and on what it. would you spray in August? Be the same mix, okay. but without, w without fish. Fish drops off about now because fish, and this is a good thing to talk about in cold climates, we're particularly concerned about too much nitrogen fertilizer in the tree to to prevent it from hardening off. Mm -hmm. And so we can get winter kill from shoots that are still growing in October when they really should be hardening mm -hmm. off and, and dropping mm -hmm. their leaves. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to move fish too late in the year. I don't really use any other nitrogen fertilizers other than compost, what's in compost. Mm -hmm. So having a, a fertility program that's not too NPK, you know, strong, mm -hmm. I think is important for cold climates because of that hardening off issue. Um, so other than that though, the neem and the, and the microbes and the seaweed keep going with the herbal teas through, through August. Um, and then the other thing that's happened just now that I've really started focusing on is nutrition. 
calcium really important both having it you know in the form of lime or or gypsum when your ph is doesn't want to be altered mm -hmm. but then also doing some calcium foliar feeding particularly right after petal fall and a few weeks after that because all of those cells in the developing fruitlets are, are made at the beginning and then they just mm -hmm. enlarge and so getting calcium into the leaves around little fruitlets is really critical and it's important that you have boron there to help move that calcium so sometimes I'll be putting solubor in those sprays too um, every few years so that's been a real focus and then there's this huge um, focus on sap analysis that's that's come out in corner in the sort of regenerative farm movement and i think there's some real interesting um lessons there unfortunately it's pretty expensive for a small grower but i think michael was just working on this a few of the folks in the berkshire roundtable are experimenting with this and i think it is a real you know it's like um, real-time feedback on what the plant might need at a, at a macro or micro probably more likely micronutrient level and i think there's some real you know, interesting things that we could be, you know, adding in our foliar mm -hmm. feeds around mm -hmm. that. But that's kind of like high level, next level. you know, yeah. stuff. Right. But that that's what I want to keep working on. And and unfortunately, Michael was very much in that work when he passed away. He was he was that's working on a new lost. book, in fact, about yeah. some of these very issues. Yeah. So some of us will hopefully try to keep that work going yeah. and, and pick up where he left up. No doubt. And then, of course, what I was saying, I'm, I'm going to be scything, you know, grass for the next few weeks. And then, uh, then it'll, it'll quiet down kind of in mm -hmm. terms of a, a ton of active management. I'll be continuing to thin fruit um, through that. Don't through have to that. thin too much fruit this season. Please. No, right. A little bit less fruit for this year. So we can talk about yeah, that as we walk. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah. Um, it's been a, what a strange event because for us... Um, a cold frost in mid-May is not unusual in our zone three climate, but what is unusual is having 80 degree weather in April. And mm -hmm. we had three days had where 90. it was, right. you had 90 yeah, in Mass, right? Down in Massachusetts, crazy. And so that just pushed bud development yeah. along. And so that's what was, things were a little further along. But having said that, the cold snap was region wide. I mean, in the Finger Lakes, they had 26. The Northeast, yeah. yeah, Massachusetts probably yeah. had mid 20s. It, I don't know what happened in the Hudson Valley, but it was really a massive cold Same front. Thing. Yep. And so um, it is interesting. I have fruit on some varieties, and then there are other varieties that flowered but didn't. And didn't you could you cut oh. in, and that ovary was yeah. destroyed. Um, I do think there's some validity and that the trees that are on larger rootstocks and this would certainly be the case with feral trees ha have more fruit that have come through so some varieties like St. Edmund's russet ha had beautiful bloom no fruit it may be partly in this orchard because I had a really strong year last year and this is kind of my off year and so that could be playing mm. into those dynamics maybe but at home I have all standard trees if not 111s uh -huh, uh -huh. and i have a ton of fruit at home and i had 24 that morning and it went below freezing at wow. 10 the night before wow. and didn't get above freezing until 8 the next morning so they were i had a lot of flowers that were still not quite open there might have been a king blossom here and there and so that got may have gotten through but then you know the other thing that i seemed to notice too was that the, the length of flowering time it was, was extended long bloom. it was a long really bloom and i almost spectacular and i this is a conjecture i have no factual yeah. information behind it but it made me think that there might be a feedback in the tree when you have really warm weather early the tree might be triggered to have a longer bloom time i don't know all the physiology going Something's on but going something on. was something was up yeah. with that so yeah. Yeah. um newton pippin had a pretty good this is a newton pippin on the end and, and we had a decent bloom there was a pretty good crop last year so some of it might have been just not a lot of fertility because of the overexertion yeah, last fruit. year but not a whole no, almost no fruit set in yeah. the newton pippin whereas yeah. liberty um set really good fruit the stemmage cluster was decent um, and then Rubinette in, in block three had a pretty good mm -hmm. set. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of, a lot of things that, you know, spy, not so much St. Edmund's nothing, nothing, you know, yeah. so it was, it was very varietal specific. Is there any 
particular uh, up on these three blocks or maybe in specific to one block where there's a particular pest or something that you are having to kind of tangle with? That's here? a good question. I don't, these blocks are not very big. The whole, all three blocks are probably only about two and a half acres and they're pretty similar in terms of slope, certainly soil type. What I've noticed mostly is that this block one is a little more, um, from soil tests and just observation, a little more, has more nutrients in the, in the top, you know, mm -hmm. a horizon of the soil. And so it's trees do a little bit. It's downhill from the barn. It's downhill from the barn. Right, the big there red barns exactly. up there. There was, there was pasture there, and this yeah. was a hay field. Yeah. And then I also think the hardwood leaf litter over the years, sure. you know, coming in from that forest edge, whereas yeah. block two and three are more surrounded by, or not, not trees around them or softwood. They're across on the, the street yeah. from the barn. Across the street You know, I mean, how old is that barn? That right? barn is and old. And that had, you know, yeah. milk cows up there. Oh yeah, yeah. You can't underestimate yeah. how much nutrient yeah. that is flowing no, down. That, absolutely. Over the years. Yep. Insects have pretty much hit the orchard, all three blocks, pretty universally. I haven't had a ton of fire blight, but I have noticed it in some of the French varieties. Medidor just can't grow it here with my management system. Mm. It has really suffered. That's the one where one varietal that, that uh, fire blight, I, I'll get a fire blight strike here and there, but never has it come in and wiped out a whole thing other than Medidora. It wasn't mm. an immediate one year thing. It was a more prolonged mm. enough strikes in a year to weaken the yeah. tree the next year a little bit more. So you're able to stop it from spreading. No, it hasn't no. been a spreading thing. And I think it. that also yeah. reflects back on the management strategy because mm. this is, you know, this is spraying for health. And so the trees are developing robust immune systems. They're able to wall off that fire blight mm -hmm. strike. And so I'm not, you know, anxiously running around cutting mm -hmm. constantly mm -hmm. strikes because I just don't have that many. Some of it might be climate. We're in a cooler climate. So the, the window for fire blight infection is much smaller than mm -hmm. say, if you were in Western yeah, Mass or yeah. certainly if you get down into the Hudson Valley or, yes. or further south. Yeah. Um, so we may have more of that to contend with in the future, but I do think this management style will help with that because the trees do have a functioning immune system and are, are getting ramped up through those priming sprays in spring mm -hmm. to, to go for it. Mm -hmm. So we're just kind of walking across the bottom part of block one right now. You can hear our boots kind of going through the grass because it, it is, you know, high growth here. Ben's keeping it up, he's just scything it. And in amongst each tree, there's a lot of ferns and all this plant life. So these honey crisp down here have been a favorite target. I think partly oh, because so close to the very tree. Short, they can drop very, in almost. They can drop in, and, <laughs> and if you look at this, oh, I see a little post, bit. Oh, there's a little this bit is of a pear. This is a highly tear. traveled corridor. Oh yeah, it's got so, some scraping on it. So we, we I put chicken wire the bottom three feet to reinforce because initially they were coming in and just chewing right through the 10x this poly you know, yeah. vinyl uh, mesh fencing. The chicken wire screen kept them from doing that, but then they start climbing the post. They use that as a push off the, That's right. the strong chicken wire. So they wire. just climb up the posts and come in. And it's really noticeable because with the tall grass, you can see their trails. So, yes. you know, after the first cutter in some places Highway. I don't get to, you can just see their trails. Mm -hmm. They tend to come in before fruit is ripened and start eating leaves on very select trees. And this is classic porcupine behavior. In the woods, they target certain trees, probably based on sweetness or some other flavor. They will go to the same tree day after day mm -hmm. and there'll be a well-worn path. They'll camp out in that they'll tree. They'll camp out in that tree, right? And then in the winter, they'll eat the bark off of huge maples, you yeah. know, like yeah. they are bark eaters. But in, in the orchard, they primarily come in and say like late August, they start munching on leaves and then they, you know, the fruits ripen in and then they <laughs> move to the fruit. It's been a particular problem with dwarf trees when they were young. And what I wanted to show you was old scars. On the tree itself yeah. where it's all kind of. This may, this might've been out. fruit breakage, but this is oh, the kind of damage oh yeah, yeah, they would cause good. when they were young. And you can see old scars, all these old scars on the trunk are from branches breaking under the weight of porcupine. We're just walking up through the bottom corner of block one through some of the honey crisps that we were just mentioning that were browsed by the porcupine and have Spartan on my right. And then uh, also on my left here as well. So just a lot of change in the, the tree species through the block. In addition to the honey crisp that came out of Minnesota, Snow Sweet is another one that is a cold climate 
And this, these trees have really been selected for production. And this is an off year. They had snow sweet, but even, and had we had not the frost, there would be more fruit. But these uh, trees have that same really great crisp flavor. They really focus on fruit. They don't grow probably as much wood as they should. It's almost like they really are yeah, focused on, on fruit, but they, they, they're a good, good choice for a northern climate. That's good to know. One of the tough things about the tree orcharding world is that it is something that should be multi-generational because of both the knowledge it takes to grow the fruit, but also um, having the infrastructure and the resources to, to propagate and, mm -hmm. and, and to trial things. Um, we made, we probably could have avoided a bunch of, of, of varietal choices if we had had an old timer say, ah, that not so much, yeah, I would, right. I'd stay away from that. But um, all of that is good work and, and um, there are incredible resources. But for me, I'm more of an in-person type of learner. And as much as I read and look at things, there's way more about- <laughs> You can't grow ca apples out of the book. <laughs> That's right. You it's, gotta get out. You gotta get out there and, and tinker. Totally, yeah. 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 So, and, and having, I mean, there's just so many varieties and, and, uh, there's an exciting to trial new ones. And in fact, I forgot to show you the seedling that had grown off the crush pad. Do you want to take a quick walk sure. back there? Yeah, yeah, sure. I just wanted to show you this one seedling that I transplanted out to show just like how, you know, vigor from a seedling, certainly for, from a cider perspective, planting more seedlings yeah. or at least trying them is, is really interesting. So talk about a, a crush pad. Well, we just, I, that's kind of a term that a former cider maker had used for, we have a concrete pad outside of our, mm -hmm. our barn. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're often taking apple mash out from the press that's in the barn. And we dump it in a pile out there that we later compost or mostly the deer consume mm -hmm. because it's so yummy. And I ha haven't found a great way to, to keep them out of it. Um, and anyway, I have occasional trees that sprout just from that wheelbarrow path from the mash. And one of them had, a, I, I noticed was like, wow, that's a really vigorous tree. And so I would say about four years ago, around there, four or five years ago, as I transplanted it into the orchard. Nice. And this is the first year it's cropped. So this will be the first tasting of what the fruit is like. Ooh, that's exciting. And it didn't have any trouble getting through the frost. You got some fruit. No, no. Wow, so another okay. indication that, yeah. you know, and so this is, it's, it's quite loaded. Probably at least three or four years on the edge of that crush pad, the concrete pad out by the barn. And when I transplanted it here four or five years ago, it was head height. Oh. So this is, this is pretty good vigorous growth and you can see, you know, good Lots fruit growth, fruit. Yeah. shoot growth is nice. Look at the height already of that have, too. That's up you know, there. Yeah. Eight, One of your taller inches. trees, it looks like. Oh too. yeah. And it's going to be a monster. You know, this tree will probably grow 30 feet tall. And I wish I had done, you know, more of this. I tried intentionally planting a bunch of seedlings just above this bed, but I didn't keep up with it. It all got kind of overgrown. Those folks that are into propagation, this is definitely exciting to keep working with, with seedlings and especially of varieties that you like for various characteristics uh, and then, then selecting for them. This happens to just be a one-off, but you know, yeah. better to have something than- You got a lot of, <laughs> lot of apples being crushed over there at yeah. the cidery. Yeah, that's right, yeah. that's right. So everything's here is hand-picked. Yep, yep. yeah, and we do some shaking um, mm -hmm. of trees and uh, we should take a look at uh, well, we, they're small now, but the Franklin tree that oh, comes Franklin. from Franklin, Vermont, yeah, yeah, we yeah, got yeah. some of those from Bill Mayo yeah. a number of years ago, and they're still in their early years. Um, but yes, that's an exciting tree to, to, cause it's Super pretty cool. good shaker. The fruit yeah. falls pretty easily with shaking. Oh, good. Good to know. So yeah. this will be interesting to see where this lands. You know, it may, it may be, um, one that you have to pick more, but, um, but yeah, that was the idea too, from, from the initial thing is to, you know, dwarf trees do have the advantage of, of being easier to spray and pick. The disadvantage is, is mat, you know, tree size really needs to be matched to soil and climate mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and variety to some extent. So mm -hmm. I, it was my own ignorance of all of those issues mm -hmm. in the beginning. There are certain, you know, varieties that 
that you probably could do on dwarf root stocks mm -hmm. in a northern climate like this. But then there are others that you should stick away from. At least go to semi-dwarf, if not semi-standard. Mm -hmm. And so that that's the experience factor really coming in and, and why if you were born into an orcharding family, you, you would, would be know. able to know that yeah. from or early on yeah. or, or really know. And, yeah. and so you just, you know, when you don't have someone that has been growing apples on a particular site for generations, you have to trial and error. The other thing I would say about dwarf trees, you know, in addition to the horticultural knowledge in terms of training, bending leaders over and having, you know, a, a decent amount of fertility because you have a root system that by, by its very nature is smaller, you really have to think about um, that management style and if it will work. So I was really into this, you know, organic management system. And I think some of the, those really kind of already dwarfing varieties on a dwarfing rootstock are going to need some additional fertility, mm -hmm. you know, and someone that's more experienced with that would, would maybe do something like some of the Finger Lakes growers do, you know, two inches of wood chips in the tree row to help, you know, build up that soil right. biology to be yes. decomposing. And then so they're also, are there. yeah, and they're also sitting on soils yes. that are already have a lot of calcium or, mm -hmm. or, you know, those cations in mm -hmm. because of their, you know, subsoil parent material is very rich. So you could do, you'd have to just make those modifications early on so mm -hmm. um, and then you know I think the other just thing is that given the erratic weather and the colder weather that this climate brings you know more vigor is probably beneficial than less mm -hmm. to deal with with challenges so that in terms of in terms of cold climate growing um, I just that's my gut feeling you know that you need you need vigor you can you can yeah, you can always. change you can calm down a tree a lot easier um, than than making up for a lack of vigor. I guess is is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So much of dwarf tree, what I think of now, what keeps them small is early fruiting, and this cold climate is notoriously takes much longer for fruit to come in. Now, having said that, it is true. You know, I got fruit on Northern Spy and seven and, you know, a seven and eight year old trees on a standard that might take 15. So there is this earlier precocity to fruit, but if you don't get them to fruit, the trees grow too much. And so what we have here sometimes is, is trees getting too large for mm -hmm. the weak anchorage that a yeah. dwarfing rootstock has. Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of it is my horticultural ignorance that, that I didn't really know. I'm a tree guy. I come, I come from, <laughs> you know, the, the forest ecology world. I, I think of trees as being big and multi-branched, whereas a dwarf tree, a high density system, which this wasn't quite high density, it called it moderate density, you really are, are, are creating much smaller trees with a lot of mm -hmm. manipulation mm -hmm. by training and, and also fruiting early fruiting because early. of that training, yep. right? Yep. And so I kind of missed the window there. So this is a real wild kind of experiment in, in uh, dwarf root systems, probably growing trees that are too big for their roots. Tips for uh, new growers. An initial soil test is really important. Get a sense of where your nutrients are but also take it with a grain of salt and that it is just a, a one sampling point, but it's a, it's a decent starting point. Mm -hmm. And making uh, modifications before you plant trees or when they're young, when it's easier to get material in. And primarily we're talking about adding minerals, whether it's calcium or potassium, phosphorus, all of the ma macronutrients. Um, there are rock minerals that you can be using to kind of set the stage mm -hmm. for good tree health because they have access to what they have. Mm -hmm. I would not worry about pruning in the first few years other than major corrective things. So if you prune too much, you're going to delay fruiting and kind of get your trees into a vegetative kind well, of growth well, for too long. Let me ask you about that piece here because a lot of like... Um, you know, people do uh, a graft onto a rootstock and you have a lot of low branches. Yeah. So leave all those low branches on is what you're saying? Well, maybe Kind of like not. a tomato plant, you know, you pick them off. Well, I think low is worth getting rid of because of you need to protect with guards. So low growth kind of goes, but okay. not getting into like being, make shaping the perfect tree in the perfect. upper canopy yeah. for too much until it starts fruiting. Pruning is really an act activity 
that should go along with, with a fruiting tree more than a non-fruiting tree. So when it's young, you certainly want to build good architecture in those scaffold limbs. You don't want limbs growing back through the center of the tree or rubbing or crossing sort of those. So there's definitely some pruning to do, but just pause a little bit and not try to, you know, sculpt the perfect tree because that tree needs as many leaves for photosynthesis as possible to grow into the, hmm. you know, the, the fruiting the tree that you tree. want it to become. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is really be focused on the certain pests that are a problem. Apple tree borer, round-headed apple tree borer, any of the borers, you gotta stay on top yeah. of because yeah. that will wipe out a tree. Yeah. Metal voles will girdle and kill a tree early on. So having trunk guards and also removing them and looking at the trunks starting about this time of you know early july for borer is really important check around the trunk check around the trunk look mm -hmm. for that frass which is the chewed wood extruding from the mm -hmm. from the trunk so really being on top of that metal voles certainly protecting from deer deer love new young apple wood more than anything else i think in the world spending time on varieties talking to as many growers as you can and in, in your local region not you know, two zones away, right. but who people that are going. And if there isn't anyone, um, then trying to reach out to people, you know, that are at, through ex your extension office or whatever, but there, there's probably somebody, if you don't know them, you will. And so really going and talk to them. Like I would have been better served going and spending time with, with Todd Parlow, mm -hmm. you know, in my early years and just really, cause he had such a diversity of, of plantings and yes. really just hammering down on what his like, you know, top, whatever, if it's 20 or 30 or 50 varieties, rather than just having a total open slate. And, and Todd Parlow is at Walden Heights Nursery in Walden, Vermont, um, about, I don't know. 40 minutes 40, or so 40 minutes away. Or so yeah. From here. yeah. Yeah. So that varietal selection is also a really important choice. So um, I think those things are really a good starting place. And then you'll have time when your trees are young to then start diving into all the nuances. But I also would say that don't try not to get freaked out about the enormity of what it takes to apple grow because you will you will grow into it. And that's why I say, if you focus on these key things, picking the right varietals for your site and the right rootstock to put those varietals or planting seedlings, that would be awesome. Uh, grafting onto existing wild trees that have already come up through the, you know, your site um, is good. And then, you know, watch out for the boar, watch out for meadow voles and watch out for deer. Like those are your big things to be worried about. There's plenty of time to learn about all of the insects that feed. And the other thing to say, Michael makes a great point in his books about this. There are key insects that do a ton of damage and most of them do pretty surficial or, or minor amount of damage. And so, you know, as you become getting into the fruiting thing, it's the internal fruit feeders that you need to worry about, whether that's uh, codling moth or uh, European apple sawfly or curculio, so the big three kind of in the early spring, and then in the fall or something, it's not fall, the summer, it's apple maggot. So there's, there's like four pests that are the heavy hitters. So that to help simplify in your mind, because you will get overwhelmed if you try to think about all of the insects that can affect your, your plants. And don't freak out about click beetles or, you know, rose chafers that much. Um, or even aphids. Those are more just things that are going to happen to some extent with any young... A little superficial. Yeah. A little superficial. But, but I mean, problem, but not a, a huge yeah. one. Yeah. And okay. then as you age into it, after the first few years, really think about nutrition. Mm. Like, keep up on that. Um, and that's where, you know, the, the color of the leaves, you know, how much shoot growth they have. Those are good, like, things you can observe. If you're, if you're having not a lot of shoot growth, you may need more fertility. You need to add more compost, more wood chips. Um, Michael talks about fungal duff management, you know, creating that, that more woodsy lignin uh, kind of surface layer, you mm -hmm. know, on the, on the soil. So mm. adding wood chips and compost are really key to creating that. Um, allowing vegetation to grow up and, and then whack it down allows that kind of scene to, to, to develop. 
so I think those are the those are the places to start. Um, that, that's great. Yeah. I mean, what a bounty of info. <laughs> I, I think we'll have to do another recording with Ben because you're just uh, a wonderful resource yourself. Yeah. So I, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for taking the time with me. On Absolutely. A My beautiful, pleasure. Beautiful, great, great day. And uh, walk around in the orchard. There's like no other place in the world I'd want to be right now. <laughs> if you would like to contact Ben Applegate, You could get his info in the show notes for this year, episode 373. You'll find it at ciderchat.com. As always, this is listener supported. Please do consider becoming a patron today or hit the donate button at ciderchat.com. And with that, I leave you here. This is Real Wind Caller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Like there is a reason why we do it like this. We like ciders. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. Yeehaw!